Thank you, Dr. Kwan. I'm very honored to be here. Um, this is a really great opportunity to be able to interact with our MD and JD dual degree holders, as well as our judges and justices. So today we're going to uh, today we're going to talk about the impact of machine learning and deep learning on more practice from a financial perspective. So this is a work in progress with Madison Rhodes, uh, who is graduating as MD, sorry, as JD and uh, MHA, and also passed the Oklahoma bar exam uh, this summer. So very exciting. So we're gonna briefly introduce what is machine learning and deep learning, and then we'll talk about what is its uh, implication on law, especially liability theories, and then what is the implication on insurance and finance industry. So basically, what is machine learning? Machine learning, from a mathematical perspective, is a function, which is a mapping from a one object to the class that the object belongs to. So because it's a mapping, you can visualize the mapping as a machine from inputs to outputs. The inputs, um, it's just a, you know, an a, a object. It could be a image. For example, it could be a MRI image of a brain tumor, right? Whereas the outputs could be a class that the object belongs to. For in this example, it could be a predicted class that whether this uh, tumor is cancerous or not. So we could also call it a predicted label. Now, in order to do this prediction or this mapping, we need three major steps. The first one is to look at this input and extract and refine the features of the inputs that could be helpful to predict the class that object belongs to. The second step is to choose the function per se after you have already examined the inputs per se. So now you look at the function, there could be infinite many uh, uh, functional forms in this world, but uh, which one is the appropriate one for you to use to predict the class of this object? Well, you will have to study more about you know which one is more appropriate, uh, but there are some traditional ones like decision trees uh, or maximum entropy, uh, Markov model and stuff like that. But you're gonna choose one and you call that chosen function as classifier and then you predict the class, right, to which the object belongs to. And then the third step is trying to uh, evaluate how good your prediction is compared to the true class this object belongs to. So that is evaluate the performance of the chosen uh, classifier. So we've been introducing this mapping and this is just a one layer mapping. If we have more layers of mapping, things will become complicated and that is deep learning uh, because the mappings can become very complicated. It really mimic the human neural networks. So that's why we name it um, neural networks. So a lot of times if you see um, you know, in AI or machine learning fields, um, they tell you that they use, you know, uh, neural networks, you know that they're actually using deep learning techniques. Now, there are two types of inputs. One is structured data, the other one is unstructured data. So structured data you see a lot often uh, in EHR data because, you know, you have the menus and if you scroll down the menus, you have those boxes which you know, which contains a lot of variables and then doctors just enter those values or make those choices. Uh, whereas unstructured data, uh, it's unstructured. For example, uh, all of the handwritten notes in clinical notes that doctors um, take during consultation with patients, it might contain some some potential diagnosis of the, of, you know, for the patients, but it's unstructured, so the data is, are scattered. Um, in terms of uh, different 
areas of machine learning and deep learning, uh, they could be classified as as the you know as the types of the inputs changes. Uh, so. Uh, if the inputs are pictures or images, then that is the field called image recognition. If the inputs are texts or words, then that is natural language processing. Uh, if the inputs are voices, then that is speech recognition. Um, now, we have different types of machine learning and deep learning models. So the first one is the most traditional one. It's supervised learning. What this has is that, yes, well, it will predict a class to which the object belongs, but it also has the true label, the true class. You know, in the example that we just mentioned before, the MRI image of a brain tumor, we're trying to predict whether that tumor is cancerous or not. We're trying to use machine to algorithms to predict. So if we have a supervised learning, then it means that the human doctors have already classified it. They know the right answer, the correct answer. Uh, that is that. So because we can compare the predicted class and the true class, we were able to find how well the, the, the learning algorithm uh, is in terms of accuracy, you can calculate the measure um, in terms of precision, and we have many other measures as well, trying to find out uh, the performance of the learning algorithm. The second one is unsupervised learning. Basically, it just means that there is no answer key there. Like there is no uh, true label uh, being found by human by human doctors yet. Um, and then there is a third one, which is semi-supervised learning. This one is basically a hybrid um, between, between the first two. Uh, so this one just uh, tried to uh, class, classify the objects using small set of data that it do have um, true label. And then after the function, the per you know, projection function uh, has been uh, found, uh, we're going to use that to extrapolate to a larger set of data that are not labeled at all. So basically there are no answer key at all. Um, and finally, in order to reward the correct, um, the correct um, uh, classification and penalize the wrong classification, uh, some parameter uh, values could be changed or some weights could be changed uh, for the function. So that is called reinforcement learning. Now, because machine learning and deep learning algorithms could be so powerful predicting um, a class uh, which could be applied to healthcare uh, to be used to predict a diagnosis or the most appropriate treatment plan. So the machine learning and um, deep learning algorithms uh, have a lot of potential to be applied to healthcare. Uh, so starting from 2000, before 2000, uh, the artificial intelligence field, they used a lot of mathematical logic based uh, algorithm, not machine learning algorithm, but the, they were not successful back then. Uh, and then after 2000, um, the whole field of artificial intelligence started to switch to statistical uh, based, learning based algorithms. That is when the machine learning and deep learning gets, uh, you know, more popular. Um, and starting from 2012, deep learning had a breakthrough in its technology, especially in its computing capacity, so that um, you know it's cheaper to com to compute many different layers of mappings uh, to have a better and you know more accurate um, prediction. So starting from 2012, deep learning really becomes uh, popular. Uh, in the field of uh, AI and its application to healthcare. By 2017, there are more than 100 startup companies uh, that develop uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithms for healthcare. 
um, until now in tw in 2000, like 2021, uh, we have about 128 startups worldwide um, producing or developing those algorithms for healthcare. Um, in 2019, FDA just defines artificial intelligence as a medical device. So uh, it has some implication um, to the products of liability theory later, which will, will be introduced very soon. So there are four different potential or actual application in healthcare. And I'm sure that um, our previous speakers have already mentioned it. So I just wanna uh, highlight the clinical decision support systems. Um, the, they could be designed as learning-based algorithms using the data in EHR in order to predict the most appropriate diagnosis and the most appropriate uh, treatment plans. Good. So these algorithms, they are not always the, you know, pred predict the, the right um, outcomes. Sometimes if there, there are some mistakes in, in the lines of codes, uh, they could produce wrong diagnosis and probably wrong treatment plan, which could be really bad to patients. Because if there is a delay um, in diagnosing cancer, then the patient might actually die because of it, because of a late diagnosis. Or if there is a wrong treatment plan recommendation, let's say from IBM or Watson, uh, you know, the patient could also be injured or, or, or die because of it. So there are some liability risks in using those machine learning and deep learning algorithms. So right now we have some regulations um, to, or the FDA tried to regulate, trying to come up with some uh, regulation framework uh, for those algorithms. Uh, but the good side is that um, the FDA has approved the use of those algorithms uh, for some situations, such as um, the diagnosis or the pre early prediction of stroke, as our former uh, speakers have already mentioned, and particularly the one uh, that's called Viz.ai. It's a startup company that successfully produced that algorithm that got approval from FDA. But the major challenge. Uh, is that these algorithms, because they are learning based, it means that they continually change themselves to have the best performance, the most accurate prediction. So the question is to what level these algorithms become no longer themselves, which were approved by FDA originally. So that is, sounds like a philosophical question, right? But it's also a very, very hard question for FDA to, 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 to decide and, and then you know, propose some regulation for that. Now, in terms of liability theories, um, there are four major uh, liability concepts um, are involved. The first one definitely is the uh, medical malpractice liability. So the CDSSS, so those are the clinical decision support system. So if they use machine learning based algorithms, um, they might, you know, they might be beneficial for doctors uh, to detect some patterns that human doctors cannot detect. Um, and they could also be really helpful for some medical emergencies when there is basically no information available uh, to doctors, right? So that could be really good. But what could be bad is that I'm, I'm sure that you talked about standard of care. So what could be bad is that if, if in the future, in a potential uh, precedent, if the court happened to use this learning-based CDSS algorithm, their, uh, their um, prediction uh, for diagnosis or treatment plan, if the court used that as 
the standard of care, then what about the physician autonomy and the individual patient's uniqueness? So that will be a huge problem. Um, right now, uh, we could think about there, there could be different levels of automation of these algorithms, just like when you think about Tesla, the driverless uh, car, it has different levels of automation as well. So at the lowest level automation, the algorithms are just a completely assistance to uh, the medical doctors. The human, human medical doctors will make their own judgments. Um, but at the highest level automation, there, there would be no doctors at all. So what would happen to, like, who is going to assume that liability? Would, you know, it, it, the answer will definitely depend on the level of automation. Now, there is another way to uh, shift the liability risks um, assumed by individual doctors to the enterprise, which is the facilities, the hospitals that the doctor work, uh, works at. So uh, there have been some trend in the past 10 years that some hospitals, they started to voluntarily buy medical malpractice liability insurance for their employed doctors. So doctors are employees, not traditionally um, like solo practice doctors. Um, so, so the medical malpractice liability insurance industry, they, they started to have less and less premiums. In other words, the medical malpractice liability in insurance industry has been shrinking in the past 10 years. So if the hospitals are going to share the liability risks with the doctors, individual doctors, for this risks imposed by the algorithms with a medical malpractice in the insurance industry will shrink even more and actually disappear in the insurance industry. That is a very interesting question and nobody knows. So it really depends on how the law is going to allocate the liability among these two parties. Okay, so the entire like insurance industry is waiting for the law response, basically. Okay. Now the product liability, as we mentioned before, uh, the algorithms uh, or the medical AI has been identified or defined by FDA as a um, device. So it's medical product. So the, the, the question is that if there are something wrong with the hardware, for example, if there is something wrong with the surgical robots, um, would the hardware manufacturer be responsible for it? And then if there's something wrong with, not because of the hardware, but it's something wrong with the software. Um, for example, several lines of codes um, had, had coding mistake. Uh, would the manufacturer still be responsible for it? Or is it the uh, algorithm developer uh, be responsible for it? So. That is also a question, but no matter what, the product liability concept uh, should be applied to these algorithms because they were defined as uh, medical devices. Yeah, um, and nowadays um, we can see that the EHR vendors, when when the hospitals they they buy EHRs, EHR systems. The EHR vendors ask the hospitals to sign agreements, and in you know so that the hospitals will not hold the EHR vendors for any mistakes. If that will happen to the machine learning based products, um, that might help the tech companies to show um, away from liability. Uh, from the hospitals and providers, but still, if patients got injured, there must be some party responsible for that. So if the tech companies sheltered themselves away from liability, then would, would only doctors and, and, and hospitals be left uh, to be responsible for that? So it is very tricky to 
allocate the responsibility among different parties, at least for those three types of parties that we mentioned above. So it's very, very challenging to separate and divide their uh, liabilities. So it depends on how the regulation or legislation or a precedent um, made by a court in the next couple of years, uh, depending on how they're going to decide, how they're going to allocate the liability risks, um, the insurance um, uh, industry, insurance industry is going to respond to it. Um, so, for example, maybe the medical malpractice liability insurance companies will merge with product liability insurance companies, but it really all depends on how the judges make decisions or how the regulators decide their framework and so on and so forth. Okay, now, in addition to the insurance industry, which is a sub-industry in the finance industry, we also looked at the, the uh, finance part or investment parts um, of these uh, startups that develop those machine learning algorithms. So you remember that we mentioned right now there are 128 startup companies in this world. So we looked at um, three different databases uh, that has you know, recorded their funding received a number of investors and we're trying to figure out where they are and how much funding they receive what is the trend for the funding and investors uh, and their innovation performance so you can see that more than half of the 128 uh, startups locate in united states and within united states more than half of them uh, locate in california which is not surprise at all, right? And then the other one, like the there, so the brown line, that is New York. So New York accounts about 15% to 20% of those startups. And then we have Massachusetts accounts for about like 10%, which is understandable because Massachusetts is more about biomedical technology rather than health information technology. Now, this is the total funding raised by all of the startup companies every year. And you could see that it has been increasing, especially starting from, from 2013 and 2014, which is just one or two years later after 2012, after that breakthrough in deep learning. Okay. So the finance industry responded very, very quickly. Okay. So nowadays, uh, we have about like more than $2.5 million uh, funding raised for those 128 companies. And this is, the, this is the mean and this is the median. So this shows that it, on average, a, one startup has raised about uh, 90 million dollars in 2021 this year, whereas a median startup raised about 70 million. So the difference between the mean and median can actually tell you, suggest, suggest that it is the top startup companies that concentrate those funding, not the mediocre, not the bottom ones, okay? Now, we looked at the number of investors throughout time. This is also very interesting. Why? Because, well, just wait one sec. Okay, so it is consistent with the money raised in the previous slides, starting from 2013 um, and you know uh, until until now. But you can see that there is a huge drop. Uh, during 2018 from 250 investors down to about like 200 uh, investors. So why this is the case, very likely is because the venture capital companies, they also have their performance requirement, which means that on average for a five year period, they expect that a startup company should make profit. If not, they're going to withdraw their funding. So this might be the reason, might, but we need to do more tests. 
So, and the majority of the investors are venture capital companies rather than the corporate uh, venture capital companies. So, and finally, we see that the number of innovation as measured as patent applications, it has been increasing uh, overall, but it dropped suddenly and dramatically. Why? Perhaps because of COVID-19 in 2020. So, so let me conclude. So basically, we briefly introduced the what is uh, machine learning and deep learning, and we briefly covered the liability risks that are associated with those algorithms um, and how the insurance industry um, will respond to whatever the law decides to do. And then we also talked about innovation risks and how the financial industry um, is going to share the innovation risks together with those startups that develop those algorithms. So we will see what will happen in the future. This is a really exciting, uh, exciting field. Thank you.